Kia ora tato everyone, no mai hari mai. Greetings to you all and welcome to this EHF live session. How can New Zealand companies incorporate circular economy principles to become more sustainable? Now we all know implementing circular economy principles and organisations can not just help them meet sustainability goals, but also create new pathways to deliver value to customers and other stakeholders. Now this session is going to focus on how circular economy innovation can prepare organizations for this era of clean tech without compromising on their bottom line in the long run. Now that's really key, like how do you bring uh, the um, economic part of it into the bottom line, right? Firstly, Edmund Hillary Fellowship is a collective of over 500 entrepreneurs, scientists, storytellers, creatives, and investor change makers who want to make an impact globally from Aotearoa, New Zealand. Now, today you will hear from Shiva Sasala, an EHF fellow who is an experienced entrepreneur and the founder of Renergy, a Singaporean innovation firm with the vision of transforming Asian cities into zero waste, zero pollution, and net zero carbon urban spaces using principles of circular economies. Regenergy builds new circular economy startup businesses through their venture studio and investment model. So now Shiva is also the founder of Circular Cities Asia, which is a New Zealand based platform promoting circular economy innovation in university campuses. Now Shiva will talk about 20 minutes and then we're gonna move into some Q&A. So just think about that. What are some of the sort of questions that you might want to um, ask? It's kind of like, how do you do it? Like, how do you go about doing this? And maybe sort of think about why should you? And what is the timing? How's the timing right? So just a reminder that we're um, recording and the session will be available afterwards. And then maybe just stay muted so there's no background talk while uh, Shiva is talking. And if you don't want to ask your questions because there's a small group, you can put your hand up. You can also put them in the chat box and I will ask them on your behalf. But otherwise, over to you, Shiva. Hi, thank you, MC. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Shiva Susarla, I'm an Edmund Hillary Fellow. Good afternoon uh, for uh, audiences in New Zealand. I'm logging in from Singapore. I know Lisa is in the US, so probably uh, good evening, Lisa. Uh, thank you for joining, everyone. Um, uh, so it's 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 early morning uh, in Singapore, fine bright day. So really looking forward to the session. Thank you for the opportunity. So I'm the founder of Renergy. Uh, like MC said, I'm also uh, privileged to be an Edmund Hillary Fellow along with Todd and and Danny here, um, and and uh, we're really looking to contribute and be part of the New Zealand economy, the New Zealand innovation ecosystem, and make ourselves useful, uh, so to speak, <laughs> to New Zealand. Uh, right, so um, at Renergy, we are uh, focused on circular economy innovation. We help organizations become more circular. We build new circular economy startups to, to sort of put our money where our mouth is and, and demonstrate how circular economy uh, can be implemented in action as well. And, and today, I just want to talk about how organizations in New Zealand can implement circular economy principles. Uh, almost everyone agrees that it's a beautiful, elegant, desirable thing to do. Uh, but often I see that there, is, there, there could be some gaps in, hey, how do we go about doing it? What's the first step? What's the second step? What is the end goal we are trying to uh, meet? How do we even know that we are circular, right? Uh, and I think this sort of uh, uh, process is what we are good at at Renergy, and I want to share some thoughts on that. Uh, I have a few slides, like MC said, and then uh, if there are any questions, I would love to uh, take them as well. So I'll just share my presentation. So yes, uh, like I said, we are Renergy. We are Asia's first innovation firm and venture studio focused on circular economy. I hope you can see my screen now. All right. Yeah, perfect. So Asia's first innovation firm and venture studio focused on circular economy. We assist organizations in getting becoming more circular. But at our venture studio, we also build new startups uh, by designing them and investing in them. And all of them focus on uh, making the world more circular uh, as we know it. So what is a circular economy, right? And, and 
the different uh, many a time and and this happens even at the highest levels of government and private sector uh circular economy is almost equated with recycling and and as circular economy practitioners we draw a differentiation so firstly let's talk about a linear economy what is a linear economy the linear economic model or the linear design is the one that's most dominant in current uh product as well as economic design it is also called as the take, make, use, dispose, or take, make, waste model. We extract resources from the earth. We make products out of them by applying labor, energy, water, and other resources, capital also. We sell the product. Uh, someone uses them. And in fact, over the decades, we all know the use cycle is coming. It's becoming smaller and smaller. People are using products for lesser and lesser time. And then we dump that uh, product or good into the landfill. This is the take, make, use, waste model, right? Uh, this is very linear because everything that we're dumping into the landfill is depleting uh, the environment and it's not being looped back into production. The linear economy has, uh, in fact, almost single-handedly contributed to a lot of resource as well as environmental problems that we have today. Uh, climate change in one dimension, but also environmental pollution, poor air quality, poor water quality in another dimension. An improvement over the linear economy is the recycling economy. In the recycling economy, uh, we still dump stuff into the landfill, except we sort of extend the use cycle. But the important thing is this, uh, the use, when we extend the use of, of the product uh, under the sort of label of recycling, we're actually downgrading the use of the product. A classic example I give is uh, from my childhood where uh, the moment my shirts uh, got slightly older, my mom would take them and use them as mops uh, at home, right? So she's extending the life of the shirt instead of dumping it into the landfill, but she's actually downgrading. She's taking a great shirt and using it for a very lower value use case. And, and what she's practicing is actually the recycling economy, right? The alternative that could save the world, that could save humankind, help us all save money and uh, usher in a new economic paradigm is what we call the circular economy. In the circular economy, nothing goes to the landfill in an idealized circular economy. Nothing goes to the landfill. The technical and biological nutrients in the product are separated beautifully. The technical nutrients go back into production cycles and the biological nutrients are safely returned to the earth, rejuvenating the soil. That is a circular economy. So, more broadly, what is it? What is a circular economy? It's an alternative design and development framework to produce goods and services that need significantly lower materials, water, and energy over their lifetime. So we've super simplified it, demystified it. Uh, we've sort of uh, put clear metrics right now over the years. The, the, the sort of uh, knowledge about circular economy has evolved to this extent. Uh, it works for cities, it works for countries, it, it works for organizations as well. And today we're talking more in the organizational context. So it's an alternative design framework for organizations to help them produce products, services, solutions that need massively lower material, water and energy footprint compared to their current baseline. And, and that uh, is what a circular economy would be for the organization in their context. There are a number of methodologies out there, right? Uh, and the circular economy itself, it's not a new concept. It's been around for decades. It's just in the last eight to 10 years that it's gained a lot of traction in mainstream thinking as well. Uh, but one of the earliest proponents of the circular economy methodology were the cradle to cradle guys. They're known as the granddaddies of circular e economy. There's a great book uh, called Cradle to Cradle. Please look it up, buy it. It's a fascinating read. In fact, the first chapter of the book uh, is called the, this book is not a tree because it's made out of plastic that can be infinitely upcycled as many times uh, as needed. 
So the first chapter itself says, hey, this book is not a tree. And through the book, we are demonstrating how the circular economy works, right? So this is called the cradle to cradle approach. It's evolved into a certification. Uh, now organizations can go and get the cradle to cradle uh, platinum rating, right? They have a five point framework, which talks about water stewardship, keeping materials or the highest value of use, uh, use of renewable energies, fair wages. So in that sense, it's a very comprehensive framework that also takes into account social aspects uh, of, of the circular economy. So the Cradle to Cradle website is very detailed. Even laymen can go and take the courses. It's they're free, I think, if I remember correctly. Um, so I'll urge all, all viewers to go and take uh, the, the courses there. They're simple, they're easy to do. And you can also get a silver rating uh, as, a, as a layman user. Uh, what's fantastic about the Cradle to Cradle website is they probably have the most ex extensive material health database in the world. So I think they've listed a few thousand materials along with health certificates to certify whether they're circular or not. So really, really amazing uh, uh, framework. The second uh, methodology that's existed for a while is from the Product Life Institute, uh, Professor Staller and others. It's called the Product Life Extension Method, uh, approach rather, right? So in, in this uh, methodology, basically you're designing products and solutions that never fail, that last forever. So you're designing for durability, you're designing to avoid obsolescence, and you're designing for rep repair and, and uh, uh, replacement rather than dumping, right? So that's the product life extension methodology. It's, it's quite academic uh, in the way they articulate things. Uh, so interested people can go to the Product Life Institute website. I think it's based in uh, uh, Switzerland, if I'm not wrong, and, and look up the extensive sort of case studies and research that they've done. The third methodology, uh, it's also, again, it's a systems level, uh, sort of framework is called industrial ecology or metabolism approach. So practitioners of the industrial metabolism approach believe that, hey, the world is linear because we are unable to track the flow of nutrients in the system. The moment we track nutrients, we can actually close the loop and make them circular, right? And therefore the industrial ecology approach focuses on how materials are metabolized through a system right? Uh, in the organizational context, that would mean how materials are used in a supply chain from cradle to grave, right? And in fact, uh, make sure that if there's no grave anymore, bring it back to cradle. So this is called the industrial metabolism approach. All three approaches or a, a blend of them work uh, and have been used by organizations. So this is uh, sort of the high level introduction to circular economy. There are nuances there, but but this is uh, great. What the Ellen MacArthur Foundation did, and uh, again, I would, I would say that this is probably the most comprehensive uh, website out there uh, that articulates circular economy principles, case studies, and thought in a very accessible manner for layman and expert alike. So I would urge everyone to go and check out the Ellen MacArthur Foundation website. Again, they have a lot of courses, a lot of case studies. It's very inf informative. What the Ellen MacArthur Foundation did uh, a few years ago is that they came up with these three very elegant principles that, that brought together all the other three methodologies we spoke about, the cradle to cradle, product life extension, industrial metabolism, and the other uh, frameworks out there. They brought them all together and articulated three very, very simple principles for the circular economy. And they said, hey, organizations can become circular if they do these three things, keep materials at their highest value of use. I spoke about my uh, T-shirt. Instead of uh, downgrading it and, and using it in a lower value of use to mop the floors, my mom could have uh, repositioned the T-shirt into another high value use case, right? So I had to become more circular. So keep materials at their highest value of use. Design out waste and pollution. The concept of waste and pollution, ladies and gentlemen, exists only in human societies. Nature is perfectly circular. We have introduced waste and pollution into, into supply chains because of our design approaches. We can do the opposite as well. 
regenerate nature. Most of our anthropogenic activity, human activity depletes nature. How can we instead regenerate it, right? So if you do these three things, if organizations can focus on these three things, uh, they're automatically circular. Now at Renergy, right, we came up with our own three uh, pillar framework based on the Ellen MacArthur Foundation uh, principles, as well as all the other schools of thought. And we did this because we felt organizations and we ourselves internally needed a practical, implementable framework for circularity. So we came up with what uh, we call the Renergy Circular Economy Framework. Again, it has three pillars as well. Organizations can become circular, ladies and gentlemen, if they become performance-based. So performance and functionality emerges as the basis of economic transaction and not product. So you're changing the incentive structures. A great example is how Philips back in the day when they still had their lighting division, they sold it now. What Philips did was they stopped selling bulbs and instead started selling lumens to their clients, right? And just by doing this, the hardware became Philips's responsibility. Earlier, they would sell the bulb, the, the filament, the glass, the product, the full product, and, and push it out of their factory and they were done. But under this new business model, Philips committed to selling lumens and now they, they sort of found that they were redesigning the bulb to make sure uh, that they were designing for durability and for ease of replacement and, and repair, right? This is how uh, change in the business model significantly changes incentive structures and can help organizations become circular. Don't sell products, become performance-based and sell performance instead. Uh, many examples, don't sell shampoo bottles, sell the shampoo instead, right? Uh, do not uh, sell uh, washing machines, sell washes instead. So this, this framework can actually be uh, applied to most products and solutions out there. Uber is a great example of how, uh, of, of demonstrating how not to sell cars, but instead sell rides instead. So become performance-based and not sell only products or solutions. The second is organizations can become nutrient aware. We spoke about how one of the fundamental challenges is that we don't know how nutrients flow through the system. The beverage company, the cola company, the FMCG company are not bad guys. It's just that after the shampoo bottle, the cola bottle leaves the warehouse, they don't know where the bottle is ending up. The moment you become more nutrient aware and track how your nutrients are flowing through the supply chain, you can close the loop around it and become circular. So build traceability and become more nutrient aware of how nutrients are flowing through your supply chain. Just a little note here, in the circular economy world, we define technical nutrients and biological nutrients. Technical nutrients are those that can be infinitely upcycled. Biological nutrients are those that can be returned to the biosphere and rejuvenate uh, soil, right? So that's, that's what we mean by nutrients here. So how can organizations become circular? Become nutrient aware. The third, become nature inspired. I've already mentioned this, there is no uh, waste in nature. The concept of waste exists only in human societies. Nature is perfectly circular ecosystem disturbed only by human activity. Organizations can look at how nature designs products and services and get inspired and mimic that uh, uh, approach and engineering principles. Uh, a whole engineering discipline has evolved along these lines it's called biomimicry. The Biomimicry Institute in, in the US uh, is the leader uh, in, 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 in this sort of approach. Janine is an awesome person and, and she's written this fantastic book called Biomimicry 3.8. And the 3.8 refers to 3.8 billions of billion years of Earth's existence uh, and how organizations and cities and countries can just learn from uh, uh, Earth's design principles, right? 
And many case studies, let's take the spider, for example. The spider uh, weaves a web uh, made, up, made up of material that is between 10 to 25 times stronger on a pound for pound basis than even steel wire, right? But the spider does it using just biological uh, reaction under atmospheric conditions. Whereas to produce weaker steel wire, we mine iron ore, mine coal, heat it to 600 degrees centigrade to force that steel wire. That is still weaker than the spider web that weaves it under atmospheric conditions. It's just incredible. Scientists are now studying how um, spiders, what kind of uh, enzymes spiders synthesize and see how they can actually replicate uh, that engineering approach. Nature inspired, ladies and gentlemen. I can give you many more examples and case studies. Organizations can become circular if they learn from nature and get inspired from nature. Okay, so... Uh, this is the energy uh, innovation principle. So how do you go circular? You can do the accreditation and standard route, uh, just like ESG, you could get ESG accredited. Similarly, you can get circular economy accreditations and meet standards. Like I said, there's the C2C certification, cradle to cradle. Uh, but then there are also a couple of new ISO standards that organizations could, could uh, use right, and, and comply with to become circular. Uh, what I would recommend, look at your products and supply chains and completely reimagine and redesign them. So start with the goal of significant reduction in materials, energy, and water in your supply chains in a defined time frame, and target zero waste to landfill for your organization throughout the life cycle. The moment you set these as guiding principles, uh, automatically you sort of usher in a completely new uh, thinking around how you design products. So this to me is a great starting point beyond the accreditations and standards. Those are awesome. But uh, to make a real lasting impact, this is your opportunity to redesign everything, right? A uh, couple of case studies, uh, Philips, right? Philips is one of the leaders of circular economy thinking, uh, very, very hardcore engineering company. They've experimented with a bunch of models. You can look up their detailed case study on the Ellen MacArthur Foundation website. Uh, they've introduced equipment buyback and trade-ins for almost all their medical equipment and de uh, devices. They've gone with functionality-based business models, which I call performance-based. They call them functionality-based business models. Uh, they even have a refurbished equipment business uh, that is that that uh, sells and the equipment is priced lower than new equipment, right? And this is great for uh, budget customers. It opens up a new segment for Philips, but it also allows them to uh, ensure that products are kept in use. So Philips has done this successfully. Uh, there are some uh, data points already that say Philips has saved money as well. Uh, I'm, I'm still sort of waiting more robust data, but but for sure, uh, some, some radical innovation there in terms of how even established engineering, manufacturing driven organizations can become more circular. We've just started working with this organization uh, recently. It's a startup company in, in Portugal, Reflaunt. What they do is they work with the fashion industry and help them unlock value from the resale market. So what they do is they connect customers who've sold their uh, pre-loved clothes. Uh, they connect them to brands and help them earn points with the brands uh, and, and redeem those points for, against new purchases. So what Reflaunt is doing is Reflaunt is creating new economic incentives and new uh, business model out of the resale uh, sort of platform. Most importantly, they're allowing big fashion brands to benefit from resale by bringing back the customer and locking them in, right? So this is an example of a new startup that's forged a new business model. And the Philips example is a, a great uh, example of a legacy 
large manufacturing organization that has pivoted and and uh, uh, introduced and embedded circularity in all their thinking and approaches, right? So uh, I'll stop here. I, I took longer than I thought I would, but happy to take questions and, and really uh, excited about the possibility of working with New Zealand organizations with the goal of becoming more circular. Thank you. Thank you for this opportunity. Thanks, Shiva. That was awesome. Does anyone have any general reflections or questions just offhand or experiences of your own with some different um, circular economy models or examples or case studies that they'd like to share? Uh, Shiva, wondering with your other organizations working with cities, what are you seeing kind of uh, trends and patterns and interesting sort of examples at the city's level? Uh, thanks, Todd. Uh, great question. So uh, at the urban scale, most interventions seem to be around uh, landfill management and, and cities saying, hey, how can we actually, and there's, there's no space to dump stuff anymore. That's the reality of the world. Uh, in fact, I work with policymakers in, in, I won't name the countries, but even in emerging economies, uh, there are two issues that, that sort of give them sleepless nights uh, and actually pursuing elections as well. It's not talk around sustainability or climate change. It's two things. One, hey, how do we convince our voters that we are managing the landfill situation well? The second is air quality and traffic. These are the two, three big issues that uh, policymakers and politicians in cities are super worried about, Todd, even in emerging countries where I'm, I have most experience in. And and they're interested in circular economy because they see that as a potential pathway to solve these problems, right? So waste, solid waste especially is a huge issue, uh, both developed uh, economy as well as emerging markets. There is, we've simply run out of space to dump our stuff. We've gotten away for the last two, three decades by moving landfills from one place to another, uh, but that is not viable anymore. So the best interventions have happened around uh landfill management and recovering material from landfills to urban mining Todd and that is where we've seen most success in the Philippines in Indonesia and India as well and I think those models will scale uh the other is around use of materials a lot of uh cities have actually taken steps to ban thin film single-use plastics uh, uh for packaging the problem is that they haven't sort of recommended what alternatives to use, and that is a problem. Uh, but at least they've taken this first uh, stick approach of banning, uh, hoping that the private sector uh, and people will respond and innovate. So that seems to be the two big areas of innovation so far. Uh, but yes, lots more work needed to do uh, around procurement as well. We were work discussing with a policymaker recently in India about how government procurement can become more circular, uh, you know, when they're sourcing for concrete, when they're sourcing for infrastructure and so on, uh, how they can actually embed circularity as a criteria, that could be a real game changer as well. Yeah, it's interesting you brought up concrete because there's a, a new startup that came through Creative HQ that actually does that now in New Zealand, recircling uh, for concrete, which is cool because okay. a lot of the pieces that are missing can get read. That you run out of um, materials wise in New Zealand can be used. Uh, Danika will go to you and then I've got a question from um, Ainsley that had to leave. Danny, you're on mute. I bet people wish that that button existed for me in real life. <laughs> um, I've got a question. So We've been having some um, correspondence on Instagram, on the old gram. Um, we've been hitting up each other's DMs. Um, so you do know what this, you know, new idea, business idea thing of mine is that I haven't launched yet. Um, oh, I think AHF know anyway. But I've been interested from the very beginning to make it as circular as possible, um, right down to the sanitary dispensers, which is not part of the business model, but it's something that I want to, you know, my original idea was a dispenser in toilets um, and a sanitary bin that had 
the human waste on one side, essentially, and the packaging on the other so that we could start to do things. And everybody around me keeps saying, no, don't do that. Just start with the minimum viable product. And what you're doing is you're selling to businesses and pub, you know, government that people, you'll take care of their periods. Like they're not going to care. The customers aren't really going to care about the circularity of it. And I'm like, but I fucking care. So um, what's your advice for um, getting started on it in terms of, you know, looking at this would add a whole extra lot of stuff, not just for me, but for anybody else as well, you know, when launching, um, is it something that you say start building in from the beginning or is it a do an MVP and then build into it later and just try and sleep or drink your guilt away? And actually, what I and I'll just before you answer that, Shiva, because that actually dovetails exactly into the question that Ainsley actually asked. So it's how do we change consumer behaviour so that we can support organisations that are following circular economy principles? Nice. So that's kind of I feel what Danny you're going in for there is that um, you know like because you need the almost the, the corporate to change as such so that the end but then the consumer yeah. it has to almost be a pull is it a push or a pull effect and what are we trying to get how do we make this happen yeah great question Danny thanks for that um, so I'll I'll sort of my responses at two levels uh, and the first level is hey how to design a perfect circular economy product or business and the second is how do we design it given uh as startups, the extreme scarce environments we operate in and, and build confidence gradually. So, so one is innovation building using lean principles and a phased approach. And the first is an idealized circular economy situation, right? So uh, just to sort of summarize uh, my understanding of what you're doing and for the benefit of the viewers as well, uh, you're selling period products and making them accessible at points of use. Uh -huh. uh, now, there are three things when it comes to sanitary products. One is the delivery mechanism. Right now, it's super packed in plastic and, and shipped across uh, oceans. Uh, the first level of circularity in your business model is you're saying, hey, we don't need the packaging anymore. We'll dispense using uh, reusable uh, sort of infrastructure at the point of use. So that's the first level of circularity you've removed you've designed out the linearity there because there's no real replacement to single use plastic in the packaging at this point oh. given current technology so you so you well there is come up with the... there actually mm -hmm. is um there, there is for the wrapping around it uh -huh. and the pad and that sort of stuff but the reason i'm not pushing those products is because they just end up in a sanitary bin that gets burned or thingied anyway yeah Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. You're just adding to the landfill, I guess. So you've sort of already innovated on the delivery mechanism. The, close, the analogy I draw is I've seen a business in Indonesia. They do amazing work. They, they basically go from household to household and dispense uh, FMCG products like shampoos and soaps at the point of use. So they're not selling shampoo bottles. They in fact work with brands to fill them in carts and they take the carts to uh, households on demand, right? Nice. So uh, households can now bring out their containers, take the shampoo and go back in. So it's cheaper because now they're not, the households are not paying for the entire bottle. Uh, yeah. and, and sort of, so so in, in that sense, you I see your business as similar. You're innovating on the delivery mechanism. The second place to innovate for you would be the materials itself. Uh, I think, a lot of them are linear. There's, I'm guessing, still a significant amount of single-use plastic in the materials you're using for the products. Uh, so that's the second area of innovation. The third is if you cannot do that, or even if you do that, manage to do that, to ensure that these don't end up in the landfill. Uh -huh. right? That would, if you also do B and C, it would be a perfectly circular business. And I think that is the desired sort of end state. Uh, that said, I would still request you to uh, do focus on one of these areas, which you already have chosen to do, which is the delivery mechanism, and demonstrate that uh, the success of that before sort of venturing into circularity in B and C, simply because 
um, that's how investors understand uh, sort of product development. That's how they prefer uh, releasing funding. And that's mm-hmm. how customers also uh, like to accept incremental yes. change more than disruptive. So I'll, given these three parameters, I would still probably request you to do one thing at a time and go the MVP route. I don't know if I uh, responded to that question well, but- uh, Yeah, you I did. I think you've explained it. Yeah, you've explained it in a way, you've explained it for the investors and for the end consumers in a way that other people haven't. Other people, it's been more about protecting myself, you know, like don't waste your money, don't waste your time. And I'm like, I don't care about money. I don't care about time. So having it reframed this way, I'm like, oh, you know, now I can understand why I should do it that way. Okay, thank you. (laughs) Thank you, Danny. Thanks for the question. Nice. I love it. Any other any other questions? Yeah, Shiva, how much have you been engaged with uh, regenerative agriculture in the sense that this is sort of moving that whole key sector in the direction of circularity? Uh, what are you seeing or how much have you been involved there? So uh, most of the work we do is in food system start. Um, and in fact, I I would say, I'll stick my neck out and say this year and the next year, uh, soil health is going to be the flavor of the season for investors. For people like us, I mean, we are committed uh, long term to the cause. So regardless of funding ups and downs, we will uh, fight the good fight anyway for the next, I don't know how many decades. But uh, just from an investor perspective, 2023, 2024 seems to be uh the 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 zeitgeist seems to be soil health right now so i think i see a tremendous influx of capital so far our involvement has been in terms of hey what can we add back to the soil to rejuvenate it uh right but we are increasingly discovering new models of carbon farming that actually could solve the climate uh contribute significantly to the solution of uh to addressing climate change as well uh, we've measured very depleted soils uh, in, in countries like India. And if you just work on the ca- carbon content in them and bring them up to uh, levels that are in tropical forests, for example, not only are you sequestering a tremendous amount of carbon back into the soil, removing it from the atmosphere, you're actually making the soil so much more fertile and conducive to uh, multi-cropping again right, with minimal use of fertilizer uh, and so on. So uh, very, very interested in the topic. I think it's going to be key to long-term sustenance of food production for, we are already 8 billion, but let's say for nine, nine and a half billion people, the, I'll stick my neck out and say, Todd, the only way to produce enough food for nine and a half people, nine and a half billion people in the long run sustainably is to work on soil everything else we are doing controlled environment farming cultivated meat oh, everything else is an interim solution that will help us bias time to rejuvenate the soil and regenerate it so that's that's uh, how we are looking at it we have a couple of exciting ideas we are working on at energy for soil health as well Great. I, I can see we, we'll have to have an offline conversation uh, soon on this because I'm working with some other fellows on some large scale uh, regenerative funds for smallholder farmers, et cetera. So look forward to, to talking. Perfect. So then make sure you then also loop in. You've got Mike Totoko, who's in this space. You've got Josh. I can't remember Josh's surname, but he actually does soil health up from the US. You've got Aaron Clapton, and there's a few others in there as well. So there's quite a few. So you can have a good little um, uh, convening on that subject. Now, Lisa, you've been patiently waiting. You have a question. Yeah, Hi, I had two. Hi, Shiva. How are you? Good. Thank you for joining um, us. Of course. So um, I had two questions. I'm not sure if they tie into anyone else that has questions, but I'll put them out there and then you can organize them however is best for you. But so one is particularly on consumer behavior um, because circular economy is still a new concept and unfamiliar to a lot of people. And also I'm thinking in some cases, particularly, for example, for Uber and Philips, where they are 
going to have to give up the convenience of having a car readily available and light bulbs readily readily available at home how can we how can we combat that and then also i'm very curious if you're allowed to share the um cities and countries that you mentioned are transforming landfills into a more circular way what exactly are they doing and how are they doing it awesome uh again thank you uh for the questions lisa uh, uh so consumer behavior is the toughest bit uh again if if a significant chunk of consumers start uh demanding right circular products uh, it's so much easier for businesses to justify to their shareholders and to investors the imperative of going circular right so consumer behavior is key um what we've realized is that is the need for simplification right when it comes to consumers so we've just launched a pet food product at least i know about it um it's called conscious creatures it's a dog food made out of insects so we had sort of started working on it last year it's finally hitting the market now after multiple trials regulatory approvals and all that now we started off calling it a circular pet food product and no one understood it they thought it was some kind of a ingredient or engineering thing uh and and it was actually lousy on our side to actually even project it that way but we were testing it out right and finally after multiple iterations we are now calling it the most eco friendly pet food on the planet right so the moment we say that we can actually see our customers eyes light up and and they actually know what we mean now some of them actually grill us on why we are most most eco friendly some of us uh, some of them take it at face value but i think for us it's reinstated the importance of making messages palatable and and making messages friendly to the right segments right customers may or may not be interested in learning about the circular economy but they want to be part of a movement and contribute to a movement that uh, you know does good for the planet right and vote with their wallet so i think brands need to ultra simplify language and give it to them in a language they understand there'll be a segment of consumers who are uh much more interested than your average consumer they'll grill you so have enough information on your websites on your uh product brochures to satisfy their questions uh so green washing is a big problem right so uh you'll have to ensure that you're authentic so be authentic have a lot of information to answer all the questions uh but most important i think to shift consumer behavior is they don't have time too much time to analyze uh when they are actually making the purchase decision give their wallets i think that is what we are uh, seeing as as sort of giving us traction so i would probably propose that uh is there a convenience loss for consumers if businesses of a performance rather than product philips did the lighting pretty well uh in the sense that they guaranteed to their customers uh, 100% availability of lumens on demand right and and uh much more easier to do in a b2b context because their customers were commercial buildings so it's easier to say office buildings it's easier to predict how people would use the space and so on so you can be prepared and you could schedule maintenance etc uh you know off hours Uber is a much more difficult example because consumer behavior is very stochastic very random so you don't know when the next guy is asking for a cab where he may have to wait for 20 minutes to find a cab and instead if he had a car uh he would have driven but ultimately i think the even in the us there's clear statistics that uh, pre covid i don't know what happened after covid we'll have to really look at the numbers lisa but even in the us uh, millennial consumers are opting not to buy cars because in in cities opting not to buy cars because they now have access to ride sharing so that is a win for circularity so it means that they are trading off a little bit of convenience for the freedom of not being burdened with uh, you know mortgage payments and emis on the car and having an asset that's parked in your uh, garage for 70% of the time
So definitely, I think consumers have demonstrated the preference. Right. So uh, that's, I hope that answers 1A and 1B. The second question was on, on uh, so, uh, cities and how they're uh, working on circularity. So most of uh, the activity, at least that's reported, uh, has been from cities in the Philippines and in India. Uh, you may not you may not feel it when you go to the cities, but I can definitely tell you that uh, the quantum of the, the volume of material dumped into the landfill or at least recovered from the landfill is significantly uh, come down uh, rather the, the recovery rates have gone up. So I can tell you that in Indian cities, the uh, recovery of solid waste fractions from landfills and from households, from businesses is very, very sophisticated. There are informal networks that work at the grassroots level. They separate the metals, plastics, the, the plastic cans. I know a business that just collects buttons from landfills and recycles just the buttons from clothes, right? So it's incredibly sophisticated. It's not as organized as it is, let's say in European cities or American cities, but there are informal networks. It's evolved in a very different way. And, and these guys are amazing with, uh, in, in the larger cities at least, really good with recovering and, and reusing most solid based fractions. Wet waste remains a huge problem. There's no real waste because it has to be localized uh, very instant. So insect farming, composting, biogas are uh, Covered and reused. In fact, I'll, I'll share with you, uh, it's almost impossible to find copper dumped in landfills in Indian cities because it's all recovered and put it back into production. Uh, right, so that's, that's uh, how sophisticated it's become. That's amazing to hear that actually. Like it's such it's 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 great. It's great to hear it, but of such a large country and population that, that it, that's just yeah, that is amazing to grasp. Shows that we should be able to do it in smaller countries, right? With smaller populations. Any other questions? Has Shiva dropped off? Has everyone just noticed that? Uh, yeah, it looks like he just dropped off. He was choppy for a minute. I was wondering if that was just me or for everybody. Here he comes. Here you're back. Hey, buddy. You're on mute. Yeah, sorry. I don't know when I uh, got bummed off. At the uh, end, it was at the end of your, your your talk. You'd already finished speaking. Yeah. But it was a bit choppy near the end of it. But I think we kind of got the gist of it. Awesome. Thank, thank you. Sorry for that. So were there any other questions or thoughts there? Otherwise, we're coming up to the end of our, our hour. And Shiva, it's been amazing. Lots of different uh, avenues to go down. And I feel there can be more conversations to hand, have with our fellows going forward, particularly as you all come into New Zealand. Um, and I can see already connections happening in with Soil Health. Yep, Todd, go for it. Oh, just one other thought. Um, Shiva, have you had much thought or reflection on the new EHF mission studio and how, what, what is the, maybe the ripest entry point for circular economy or the things you're looking at? Uh, absolutely, I did. Uh, in fact, I've participated in the other climate conversation also the other day. Uh, so um, I think food systems are, are very, very ripe uh, for circularity, uh, especially in New Zealand. It is a sector under threat. Uh, because of developments. So New Zealand is a significant producer of conventional clean and, and uh, food produced using conventional methods. And, and there's a wave of disruption that's going to hit us in New Zealand. Uh, so I think that is uh, an immediate sector where I think circularity can be useful, not just for businesses to unlock value and because it's the right thing to do, but also because they need to prepare for the imminent threat that's coming. Uh, you know, we have a lot of dairy, uh, meat sectors, and I think it's very, very, uh, they are, they are going to get disrupted. So it's imperative for them. And I think they are, uh, they could use circularity to, to sort of come up to speed with 
the modern methods of of producing the same uh, i think end consumer uh, services a lot of e-commerce re-commerce etc can happen Todd, it's a small economy a lot of goods are imported so i i seen that import duties can be expensive so goods and services and products are more expensive in new zealand than elsewhere just because we have to import everything and then the economy is small so all the more reason i think that we should have a strong repair reuse refurbish culture uh and and opportunities for businesses to sell uh you know products and goods to each other equipment and 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 input goods to each other so i think there's a lot of opportunity for new e-commerce platforms to emerge these i think are immediate so agriculture food systems and and commerce among organizations to promote the refurbish reuse repair economy i think these are two very immediate opportunities that will actually have an immediate bottom line impact as well Don. Mm. and also like when you have the floods like we have where it has taken out you know almost 100 percent of new zealand's um either tomato or corn area that was for wattis that they uh, put into frozen packs or into their yeah. canned goods you know so now what are they going to do import or right. find somewhere else yeah yep no that's great love it brilliant well thank you shiva for sharing and thank you for the energy and um and, and making more connections and making it happen and, and, and getting on and convening so um thank you again and thank you everyone else for turning up and uh, good questions and hopefully see you at some of the other sessions that are coming up Thank you to everyone. Thank you for the opportunity. Thanks all for joining. Really appreciate it.